Camille by Alexandre Dumas Ville. Chapter 1 In my opinion, it is impossible to create characters until one has spent a long time in studying men, as it is impossible to speak a language until it has been seriously acquired. Not being old enough to invent, I content myself with narrating, and I beg the reader to assure himself of the truth of a story in which all the characters, with the exception of the heroine, are still alive. Eyewitnesses of the greater part of the facts which I have collected are to be found in Paris, and I might call upon them to confirm me if my testimony is not enough. And, thanks to a particular circumstance, I alone can write these things, for I alone am able to give the final details, without which it would have been impossible to make the story at once interesting and complete. This is how these details came to my knowledge. On the 12th of March, 1847, I saw in the Rue Lafitte a great yellow placard announcing a sale of furniture and curiosities. The sale was to take place on account of the death of the owner. The owner's name was not mentioned, but the sale was to be held at 9 Rue d'Antin, on the 16th from 12 to 5. The placard further announced that the rooms and furniture could be seen on the 13th and 14th. I have always been very fond of curiosities, and I made up my mind not to miss the occasion if not of buying some, at all events of seeing them. Next day, I called at nine Rue d'Antin. It was early in the day, and yet there were already a number of visitors, both men and women, and the women, though they were dressed in cashmere and velvet, and had their carriages waiting for them at the door, gazed with astonishment and admiration at the luxury which they saw before them. I was not long in discovering the reason of this astonishment and admiration, for having begun to examine things a little carefully, I discovered without difficulty that I was in the house of a kept woman. Now, if there is one thing which women in society would like to see, and there were society women there, it is the home of those women whose carriages splash their own carriages day by day, who, like them, side by side with them, have their boxes at the opera and at the Italien, and who parade in Paris the opulent insolence of their beauty, their diamonds, and their scandal. This one was dead, so the most virtuous of women could enter even her bedroom. Death had purified the air of this abode of splendid foulness, and if more excuse were needed, they had the excuse that they had merely come to a sale. They knew not whose. They had read the placards, they wished to see what the placards had announced, and to make their choice beforehand. What could be more natural? Yet, all the same, in the midst of all these beautiful things, they could not help looking about for some traces of this courtesan's life, of which they had heard, no doubt strange enough stories. Unfortunately, the mystery had vanished with the goddess, and, for all their endeavours, they discovered only what was on sale since the owner's decease, and nothing of what had been on sale during her lifetime. For the rest, there were plenty of things worth buying. The furniture was superb. There were rosewood and boule cabinets, and tables, Sevres and Chinese vases, Saxe statuettes, satin, velvet, lace, there was nothing lacking. I sauntered through the rooms following the inquisitive ladies of distinction. They entered a room with Persian hangings, and I was just going to enter in turn when they came out again almost immediately, smiling and as if ashamed of their own curiosity. I was all the more eager to see the room. It was the dressing room, laid out with all the articles of toilet, in which the dead woman's extravagance seemed to be seen at its height. 
on a large table against the wall, a table three feet in width and six in length, glittered all the treasures of Ococ and Odio. It was a magnificent collection, and there was not one of those thousand little things so necessary to the toilet of a woman of the kind which was not in gold or silver. Such a collection could only have been got together little by little, and the same lover had certainly not begun and ended it. Not being shocked at the sight of a kept woman's dressing room, I amused myself with examining every detail, and I discovered that these magnificently chiseled objects bore different initials and different coronets. I looked at one after another, each recalling a separate shame, and I said that God had been merciful to the poor child in not having left her to pay the ordinary penalty, but rather to die in the midst of her beauty and luxury, before the coming of old age, the courtesan's first death. Is there anything sadder in the world than the old age of vice, especially in woman? She preserves no dignity. She inspires no interest. The everlasting repentance, not of the evil ways followed, but of the plans that have miscarried, the money that has been spent in vain, is as saddening a thing as one can well meet with. I knew an aged woman who had once been gay, whose only link with the past was a daughter almost as beautiful as she herself had been. This poor creature, to whom her mother had never said, You are my child, except to bid her nourish her old age, as she herself had nourished her youth, was called Louise, and, being obedient to her mother, she abandoned herself without volition, without passion, without pleasure, as she would have worked at any other profession that might have been taught her. The constant sight of dissipation, precocious dissipation, in addition to her constant sickly state, had extinguished in her mind all the knowledge of good and evil that God had perhaps given her, but that no one had ever thought of developing. I shall always remember her as she passed along the boulevards almost every day at the same hour, accompanied by her mother as assiduously as a real mother might have accompanied her daughter. I was very young then, and ready to accept for myself the easy morality of the age. I remember, however, the contempt and disgust which awoke in me at the sight of this scandalous chaperoning. Her face, too, was inexpressibly virginal in its expression of innocence and of melancholy suffering. She was like a figure of resignation. One day, the girl's face was transfigured. In the midst of all the debauches mapped out by her mother, it seemed to her as if God had left over for her one happiness. And why, indeed, should God, who had made her without strength, have left her without consolation under the sorrowful burden of her life? One day, then, she realized that she was to have a child and all that remained to her of chastity leaped for joy. The soul has strange refuges. Louise ran to tell the good news to her mother. It is a shameful thing to speak of, but we are not telling tales of pleasant sins. We are telling of true facts, which it would be better, no doubt, to pass over in silence if we did not believe that it is needful from time to time to reveal the martyrdom of those who are condemned without hearing, scorned without judging. Shameful it is, but this mother answered the daughter that they had already scarce enough for two, and would certainly not have enough for three, that such children are useless, and a lying in is so much time lost. Next day, a midwife, of whom all we will say is that she was a friend of the mother, visited Louise, who remained in bed for a few days, and then got up, paler and feebler than before. 
Three months afterward, a man took pity on her and tried to heal her morally and physically. But the last shock had been too violent, and Louise died of it. The mother still lives. How? God knows. This story returned to my mind while I looked at the silver toilet things, and a certain space of time must have elapsed during these reflections, for no one was left in the room but myself and an attendant, who, standing near the door, was carefully watching me to see that I did not pocket anything. I went up to the man to whom I was causing so much anxiety. Sir, I said, can you tell me the name of the person who formerly lived here? Mademoiselle Marguerite Gautier. I knew her by name and by sight. What? I said to the attendant. Marguerite Gautier is dead? Yes, sir. When did she die? Three weeks ago, I believe. And why are the rooms on view? The creditors believe that it will send up the prices. People can see beforehand the effect of the things. You see, that induces them to buy. She was in debt then? To some extent, sir. But the sale will cover it. And more, too. Who will get what remains over? Her family. She had a family? It seems so. Thanks. The attendant, reassured as to my intentions, touched his hat and I went out. Poor girl, I said to myself as I returned home. She must have had a sad death, for in her world, one has friends only when one is perfectly well. And in spite of myself, I began to feel melancholy over the fate of Marguerite Gautier. It will seem absurd to many people, but I have an unbounded sympathy for women of this kind, and I do not think it necessary to apologize for such sympathy. One day as I was going to the prefecture for a passport, I saw in one of the neighboring streets a poor girl who was being marched along by two policemen. I do not know what was the matter. All I know is that she was weeping bitterly as she kissed an infant only a few months old from whom her arrest was to separate her. Since that day, I have never dared to despise a woman at first sight.